Hi, people. Um, I've just watched an interview with Liz Truss. Uh, she's in New York City for the postponed UN General Assembly. Postponed, of course, because of the Queen's State funeral. Um, and she was in an interview with Beth Rigby of Sky News. Uh, let me just say from the outset, I think Beth Rigby done a great job. Um, she was direct, but not rude. Um, she asked the right questions. The sort of questions I think the public want journalists to ask. Because sometimes you get these high-profile interviews and questions are missed out, but I, I think Beth Rigby done a very good job. Um, so Truss is still pretty new in the job. She, what would it be now, but day 15, day 16, something like that. Um, when a new prime minister comes to office, um, I always sort of take this view, well, give him a chance. It's a very, very pressurising job to be the leader of the government of the United Kingdom. I was going to say leader of the United Kingdom, but our head of state is King Charles III, uh, although he's not a politician. Um, and many would say that the Queen was the leader of Britain, de facto, um, in terms of the eyes of the world. But in terms of the political power, of course, it's the Prime Minister. Um, it's a very powerful position. It's also a very, very um, pressurising position. And certainly Liz Truss has had an unenviable situation in terms of the profound historic events that have happened over the last um, 10, 12 days. Uh, I mean, literally day one on the job. I do wonder, I mean, this will probably never be revealed, but I do wonder if, um, if Her Majesty actually perhaps said something in that audience, like um, maybe she knew her time was up, maybe she knew that it was near the end, and maybe she told Truss this. Apparently she was very candid in her meetings with Prime Ministers. Um, back in 1936, Stanley Baldwin saw no fewer than three monarchs in one year. Um, so George V died, Edward VIII ascended the throne, and then Edward VIII abdicated in favour of his, well, in place of his younger brother, George VI. So Stanley Baldwin has a rare distinction of being, I think, the only Prime Minister to have seen three monarchs in one year. Uh, a few other prime ministers have seen two monarchs in one year, but we talk about this monarch has seen so many prime ministers. Well, Baldwin saw three monarchs. Uh, Truss has seen two. Um, you know, she was Queen Elizabeth II's 15th prime minister, British prime minister. She had 179 altogether across the Commonwealth, but also King Charles III's first prime minister. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about Truss because I mentioned, you know, I always try to give a new Prime Minister a chance, but he just comes across as tone deaf to me on so many issues, and particularly the issue of um, tax and energy companies. And I'll come to that in a minute, but let me just give her a plus point, first of all, to be fair. Because when it comes to high-profile politicians, I believe in being fair, I believe in looking at both sides. So, the plus side is I think she was quite a good Foreign Secretary. Uh, she was tough with Moscow and Beijing, uh, you know, not the pushover or rather the the sort of appeasing tone that previous foreign secretaries and frankly previous administrations had. I mean, when it came to China, the Cameron and Osborne years were, in retrospect, a very big mistake. They gave far too much away in terms of appeasement. Um, Truss was a good foreign secretary and it wasn't just a case that she was tough where she needed to be. Um, she secured trade deals with uh, Japan, with Australia. She deserves credit for that, and I give her credit for that. As Prime Minister, uh, well, first of all, let's look at that campaign, that very prolonged campaign. I felt it was longer than it needed to be, and I think a lot of people felt that, even Tory members felt that. It seemed to drag on for a long time. Um, and, you know, history will ask, was the wrong decision made. Maybe Rishi Sunak should be Prime Minister. Maybe it should be Penny Morton or Kimi Badenoch or any of the other candidates. But the decision was made, the Tories chose Liz Truss. So for better or worse, that was the decision. Um, and, you know, everything we want to say here, the question will be, would they have done it differently? Because what politicians say on the campaign trail is not necessarily the same as what happens. But what do we know from the campaign trail? Well, during that campaign, 
when the issue of Johnson's uh, sleaze came up, as it did a few times, and after all, it was the whole reason why his government fell and the whole reason a leadership contest was called. Liz Truss doggedly uh, defended him. Now, I think that, to me, that's a red flag. And it isn't overly surprising. She was an insider, as was Rishi Sunak. Some would say that she was loyal to Johnson by not resigning, and she felt the duty to continue in her job. Uh, and others would say, well, Sunak only resigned because he was ambitious and he wanted to run. You could also argue it was a matter of conviction resigning rather than continuing to serve a prime minister he no longer agreed with. So there's different ways to look at that. Although I would argue all those major leadership contenders, they all waited till the last moment. It's the backbenchers. You know, if like me, you believe Boris Johnson is a corrupt figure, it's the backbenchers that deserve credit. They were the ones who, who did um, push that vote of no confidence and they got quite a lot of vitriol from it for doing it from the likes of Nadine Doris and other Johnson uh, acolytes. Um, but, you know, on the camp campaign trail, the, must, the most that Trust could muster up was, well, he made mistakes and he admitted it. Honestly, I think this woman is tone deaf to domestic issues. She's good on the world stage. Um, I do believe that she will be a good stateswoman on the world stage. But domestically speaking, I think she's tone deaf because she cannot grasp the, the anger there was against Partygate. I mean, the fact of the matter is, and I don't think this is a trivial thing. You know, some Tories say, oh, well, uh, let bygones be bygones, move on. The fact of the matter is, in the biggest, um, the biggest example of, uh, let's say, a rollback on civil liberties ever, certainly in modern times anyway, uh, you know, we've seen often like it in terms of the restrictions that were placed during COVID now. Most people conceded that they were necessary. Um, the debate is out on whether they were effective or not. But I think most people recognised the government had to do something. This was a deadly pandemic. It was spreading. And this country had at least 150,000 deaths. You know, it was a major, major event. It's not 100% gone, but it is largely gone, I would say, from this country. But regardless... Um, the fact of the matter is, the government of the day, Boris Johnson's government, imposed very strict lockdown measures uh, to the point of hefty fines, even prison sentences. There was one student who was fined £10,000 for holding a party. Now, he shouldn't have done it. Um, but the hypocrisy of the Tories is just staggering. And I think it is infuriating that they really do have this attitude. There's one rule for us and another for everyone else. When Partygate was going on, I remember um, a lot of Tories were saying, oh, it's just a Labour plot. It's just it's just trying to make Boris look bad, as if he was a child not responsible for his own actions. The idea that he didn't know what was going on um, in his own house is utterly absurd. And this wasn't a few drinks outside. This was actually quite a raucous affair. Apparently, to three in the morning, people throwing up alcohol on the walls i mean apparently it was quite a raucous party on the night that um the queen became a widow when prince philip was buried of actually i think it was after the state funeral um johnson had to deliver a groveling apology to her i mean the way the way this man had a contempt for i just think boris johnson is the most corrupt prime minister of my lifetime now you might say Tony Blair had his skeletons because of Iraq. I think Iraq was... Um, because people will... Excuse me, just hit the laptop. People will inevitably draw comparisons. Tony Blair um, was guilty of one of the worst foreign policy decisions we ever made. Okay. Uh, I'm talking in terms of domestic politics here. I mean, I don't think you can underestimate the amount of sleaze that went on in a relatively short premiership, three years just over three years. And it was one thing after another. If it was just party gear, that was bad enough. But it was Dominic Cummings' affair. Again, Johnson dug his heels in, refused to act initially. Um, it was a Matt Hancock affair. It was a Chris Pincher affair. It was just one thing after another. And every time Johnson sort of made these groveling apologies and then 
just continued. Now, I think someone like John Major, and the interesting thing is the Major years were connected with Leeds, but I think a Prime Minister with more integrity, like John Major, would have said, this is clearly bad. We need to do something about this. I honestly think Duncan was complacent. I think he had an arrogant attitude to it. Um, and I think the Tories are a pretty arrogant party. I think they believe they are born to rule. Now, this isn't to say that there aren't good Tories out there. There are Conservatives I have respect for, people like Tom Tupenhat and others. Um, so I'm not just vilifying every Conservative MP, but I do think they're tone deaf to public opinion. Now, that brings me to this interview. Um, Beth Rigby was asking very valid questions about the perception of fairness when Liz Truss refuses, point-blank refuses, to even consider the idea of taxing these big energy companies a windfall tax. Now, Germany does it, and that doesn't seem to be affecting the German economy. I might be wrong about that. Maybe it is. It doesn't seem to be. Her argument is that um, we need capital investment in order to grow the economy. But when she was asked this question about the optics of it, typical politician, she just evaded it. She sort of, I don't buy this idea that um, taxing the rich will, will help everyone. She's ignoring what Beth Rigby was actually asking, which is about the perception of helping the rich and powerful. I don't think trust, or maybe she does get it, but she just is evading it. She just doesn't care. I think she sort of sees this as her 1981, i.e. at that time, Margaret Factor was very unpopular. Uh, the Falklands came along and arguably saved her, although I think it was the right decision to make that um, intervention. But I think trust, because she very much modelled herself on Margaret Factor, I think she sort of thinks, well, I'm going to be tough, I'm going to tough this out, I'll be unpopular, but the people will thank me in the end. And it's this arrogance of power. The thing is, um, unlike Margaret Thatcher, she didn't come in on a landslide. And unlike Margaret Thatcher, uh, she wasn't like the first Tory Prime Minister of that period. She's the fourth Tory Prime Minister. I really think if trust continues to be toned deaf to public opinion on issues like public anger against the energy companies, um, you know, at the very least, even if she's going to stick by this policy, at the very least, she can say, I understand, but I have no choice, even if she puts it that way. But she just sounds like she just doesn't get it. When she's asked straightforward questions, she evades. She, she just sounds like she is out of touch. Um, I think even David Cameron and Theresa May would have given a more direct answer and said, look, I do understand it. I don't. I think trust lives in a bubble, or she gives this impression. I know that she goes around the country. She meets people. Some would say she's. Um, uh, well, she doesn't have actually the rapport that Johnson had. Corrupt as he is, I think that's why he survived so long. He did have rapport. I think he's still a very corrupt figure. Um, trust isn't a good communicator. Now, clearly, she's done enough to win the Tory leadership contest, but I honestly think she's going to have a short premiership, two years and then she'll be out. And quite frankly, I have no sympathy. Um, I'll give her credit where credit's due. Apparently, good news in Ukraine, the five Britons who are currently held hostage by the so-called Donetsk People's Republic have been freed. But apparently this was from the intervention of the Saudi Crown Prince. That's interesting. Um, it's great news for their families coming in the week that Ukraine's also made big advances. Now, I don't envy Liz Truss on that. Uh, when it comes to foreign policy, I don't think there is much merit to be had in sniping away at a prime minister when they're taking on a brutal dictator like Putin. So I support Liz Truss when it comes to Putin. I want her to be successful. But in terms of domestic policies, um, this is just pure Toryism, supporting the rich and powerful. I mean, she says that, uh, she's going to help the most vulnerable households, but I think that was done grudgingly and only because Labour got there first. I just don't think she really gets public anger. I mean, in 2011, David Cameron didn't get this either. His so-called big society, you know, that was being proposed at a time when, um, after the Great Recession, during the Great Recession, bank agreed with the thing, okay? And the anger then was against the bankers. Now it's against the energy companies. 
you don't have to be a fiery socialist to say there is something fundamentally rotten about this. I mean, you can be damn sure that the bosses of Shell, British Gas, uh, Scottish Power, and all those other big energy companies, EDF, those guys, and it is mostly men, are on uh, plus million pound salaries. They're not going to be worried. And I'm not saying there should be class war and they'll just take, you know, tax them at 50% or something like that. But I do think it is right that those who can shoulder the burden should take the burden. This idea that if we tax and they're going to invest elsewhere, well, what does that say about them? I'm not sure if it's even true because there was um, an entrepreneur, a billionaire, I forget the guy's name, but even he was conceding that there should probably be some sort of windfall tax at this time when so many people are struggling. This was coming from a billionaire. Many people will look at this and say, this is just typical Toryism, a party of the rich, by the rich and for the rich. And I know that not every Tory MP is rich and that might sound kind of, oh, you're playing class war, but this is the optics of it. This is the optics of it. Um, the fact that Liz Trust is so reluctant to even consider this, um, I think she's tone deaf. If at the very least she can say, look, I understand public anger, but we've no choice. We have to enact this policy. But she won't even do that. She just wants to defend these energy companies. And frankly, it's infuriating. Now, in of itself, you can maybe say, well, if it does help the economy, if it helps out families, that would be one thing. But taxpayers are going to fit the bill. Um, I just think the optics are very bad. She also said in this interview, oh, I'm prepared to be unpopular. Now, that might be noble if it was the right policy. But when you are, you know, the fourth prime minister of the same ruling party, when you have red wall seats that you can't be complacent about, what she's basically saying is, I know this could cost me the next general election, but the hell with it. Now, is that noble? Is that a case of standing by conviction? Or is that actually damaging her own party? And I don't think it is necessary. I'm not an economist. I could be dead wrong about all of this, right? But from interviews I've seen, from uh, what a lot of experts are saying, a windfall tax is not only morally justified, it's actually practically right. Um, it would actually help the economy. Um, I don't know. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Truss is doing something here that really is necessary and the, the great British public is going to have to just put up with it. But I do think there is something fundamentally rotten about the rich getting richer. And I don't think you have to be a socialist to see that. This is always the problem that the, the problem that the Tories have had. You know, would Sunak have done it differently? In the last few debates, he was talking about uh, taxing the rich more. Maybe this was Sunak's way of saying, well, look, I'm a rich guy and I'm saying let's tax the rich. Maybe it was his sort of reflection from that. I don't know. And, um, you know, what someone says on a campaign trail and what they actually do is two different things. Um... We do need a prime minister who is tough with Russia and China, and that Truss is, but I think Keir Starmer is on to something here. I think he knows that there is growing public anger about the Tories being out of touch. And the fact this woman doggedly defended her very corrupt predecessor, I think it shows where her mindset is. She just fails to see public optics. I think she's out of touch. I don't think she's stupid. Some people say she's clueless. I don't think she is, actually. I think she's quite intelligent but I think I do think she's out of touch um, and she's not politically savvy enough to see it, to see that this will hurt her and her party at the polls now is it enough to say well it's noble to stand by your conviction if it's the right thing for the country even if it costs a politician at the polls it would be noble if it turns out to be the right policy but will it? Time will tell I guess uh, and even then I, I wonder is it noble to support the rich and powerful when ordinary people will definitely suffer. I just don't know that there's a moral argument in that. And I could be wrong. I, I don't think that there is. But yeah, I feel I felt quite angry watching that interview, to be honest, because I'm thinking, you're not listening. You're out of touch. Um, at the very least, can you, can you just concede? Can you just recognise that there is bad optics in this? Even Boris Johnson had the tact 
say that he understood there was public anger about one rule for us and another for everyone else. Of course, it didn't stop him being corrupt. Um, but don't forget, Liz Trust defended Johnson's corruption. I think, to me, that's already a red flag about what this woman's judgment is. Um, and like I say, if Labour win in 2024, I don't think it will be a huge endorsement for Labour. I personally have big issues about Labour. My two biggest concerns is Keir Starmer's personal pandering to woke ideology. I'm very concerned about that and identity politics. The other thing I don't like, I think Labour's soft on crime. Uh, it's one area. I mean, it's not that the Tories' record is great. They're meant to be the party of law and order. Precious little has changed on their watch. Dominic Raab done a few good things, but I really think the system needs a radical overhaul. I think that the Ministry of Justice, I think I think the legal establishment just is, is out of touch. Uh, I've made my views on that very clear. But anyway, if Labour could show, prove, they will be tougher on crime, push for tougher sentencing, and distance themselves from woke ideology, then I would vote Labour tomorrow. Because I'm not concerned about Keir Starmer on foreign policy. You know, he's not Jeremy Corbyn. He doesn't have dangerous anti-West worldviews. He's quite sensible. He has been very clear in his support for Ukraine. He's been very clear that we need to be tough with Moscow and Beijing. So I'm really not concerned with Keir Starmer in terms of foreign policy. But, you know, it's early days. Maybe Trust will do some things that turn out to be popular. But at the moment, I doubt it. Um, to me, it's her intransigence, her, her her doggedness, intransigence, if that is the right word, just her her failure to grasp, or f maybe worse, not care about public opinion. She knows best. Maybe she does. Maybe we're all wrong. But I just think there is something fundamentally, and I don't think you need to be a left winger to see this. There is something fundamentally wrong about greedy energy companies, and that's what I call them. I hope that they feel the heat. Um, quite frankly, you know, if these energy bosses, if they're heckled in their local shopping centre or whatever, I think it would be well deserved because they're just greedy. If they had integrity, if they had any sense of human compassion, they would voluntarily take a pay cut in recognition of the situation we're in. The king has, by the way, the king has already said he wants to tone down coronation. So the king is in touch, I would say, more than the prime minister is. And, you know, the king's, uh, he has a life of privilege, but he understands the optics of this. He understands that he is a new monarch and he has to set the right tone. And I think so far he has done so.